The Lord be with you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bonaire United Methodist Church on this last Sunday of October. Just moving fast, beautiful colors outside, light rain. What could we ask for any better than to be right here on a day like today? So it's good to see everybody. I'm Bert Brooks, pastor and preacher today. Reverend Kathleen Monge is assisting in worship. Kathy Toole is our minister of music along with the Sanctuary Choir and the Brass. And so we have got a wonderful day of worship, of music, of word, of, of what we're supposed to do when we come together on Sunday morning. A special welcome to any of you who are visiting with us. We're so glad you're here. We want you to make yourself at home. Just enjoy this time. And uh, if you could, I'd love to... Kathleen or I, one of the two uh, greet you after the service so that we can at least just kind of make contact and, and uh, get to know you briefly on your way out. So again, just make yourself at home today. There is an attendance register on your row. If you could find it and send it down, we'd have a record of your being with us. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of quick uh, announcements. Uh, first of all, Next Sunday is a first Sunday, so we have breakfast, men's breakfast, 845. We have a book discussion. Some of the adults are coming in for the book discussion at 945. Regular Sunday school at 10 and combined communion worship at 11. So I also think, isn't next Sunday uh, fallback time? I believe it is. So if you are here at 715 next Sunday morning, We'll have the coffee ready if you're just, you know, you just get to here too early on the, on, on the change of times. It's also All Saints. All Saints Sunday. And now that you uh, have, have reminded me, Dottie wanted you to know that our tradition for anybody who has lost a loved one in the last year is to write their name on the little bell ribbon that are out in the uh, narthex. And that will be brought in. And we will remember and celebrate the saints who have gone on before us in the year past. So that's available to you today. There are other announcements in the bulletin at your convenience. I would invite you to take a look at those announcements and let us know what you're interested in. Email us, call us, just uh, tap us on the shoulder, and we will get you where you need to go. Let us now enjoy this time of worship. For those who are able, I would invite you to please stand for our call to worship.
Praise is due to you, O God, O you who answer prayer. Happy are those who live in your courts, those who are satisfied with the goodness of your house and your holy temple. You are the hope of all things, Holy One, from the ends of the earth to the farthest seas. You make the gateways of the evening and the morning shout for joy. Rejoice in God, O oh people, and be glad. Let us shout and sing together for joy. sit down yet. There are children on your row that I'd love to share a story with, so I want to invite any children that want to come forward, if you would do so. 
And while they're doing that, see if you can find a hand to shake or somebody to say good morning to and welcome each other. that hearty welcome and we treat everybody as friends here and so thank you well good morning everybody it's so good to see you let's go over our little special you and I greeting Jesus loves me every day and every day Jesus loves me hey you all don't have to wear glasses do you good for you Sometimes it's hard for me to see through glasses. And I want to tell you that when adults and sometimes kids and youth need glasses, it helps us see so much better. It clarifies the world around us. And when you learn about these kinds of things, there's something called 2020. Do you have any idea what 2020 means? Has anybody studied that before? Do you all know what 2020 means? How many of you are 2020? Okay. Two, three, okay. Well, if you're 2020, it means your eyesight is really good. And if you're not 2020, it doesn't mean you need glasses, but it means that you might have to squint a little bit here or there to read the words. Now, if you're like me, guess what I am? I'm like 2160. <laughs> Are any of you there? Is there, is, can you be 2160 or not? I mean, my eye doctor says, Bert, you need to wear these glasses 24 hours a day. You need to sleep in them so you can see your, what you're dreaming about. So it's, uh, <laughs> But 2020 is also a year. When is 2020? Do you know when that's coming up? When? Just tell me. Next year. How many times do you think we're going to have a year of 2020? How many? Okay, all right. You're exactly right. You know, sometimes after we get up, we have to do stuff so we can get functional pretty quick. But uh, 2020 is next year. And I want you to know something that we're doing here at the church is we are looking to next year on how we can help people in... Ducks. You see ducks? Where? <laughs> Oh, I see them too. Sure, sure, absolutely. But 2020 is a number I want you to hold on to today, okay? And hold on for the next few months because when we get to 2020, we really want Bonaire Church to do such greater work among the poor and the hungry and people who don't have a home we really want to be the people that God wants us to be. Not just in 2019, but in 2020. We want our eyesight to be perfect about the needs of those around us. It is so good to see you all today. And I saw some of you yesterday, and I bet I'll see some of you later this week, here or there. Let's have a prayer before you go. Would you bow your head and repeat after me? Dear Lord... Thank you for seeing the world around us and allowing us to help people. 
Amen. Thanks, everybody. I did see you yesterday. I had a good time yesterday, too. I saw you yesterday. And I saw you. Did I see you yesterday? Okay, good, 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 good. Well, as they are returning to their seats, I'm not sure that story went exactly according to plan, but, um, <laughs> you know, I hopefully you all got something out of it. But uh, before we go into our time of uh, prayer, I do want to share some joys and celebrations. And I do want to thank you all who made that fall festival yesterday. Just a really uh, exciting event. It was taken over this year kind of by a team, United Methodist Men, United Methodist Women, the Children's Ministry, the Youth Ministry. There were lots of people involved. And I, I bet uh, I saw some of you there. So uh, I understand, uh, Chris Scholes, how many hot dogs went out uh, to, the, to the crowd? 300 hot dogs, probably just as many bags of popcorn. So. A lot of them we stew, but I have some left. If you, you know, That's I right. We... We have Brunswick stew left. So, Chris, where are you going to be if so? Commons, if you want to get some stew from the United Methodist men. And again, it all goes to, to missions in the community. So, we had a great day. Last Sunday, Michelle, you counted 30 people, didn't you, for the crop walk? Over 2,030 people participating. Now, there was a glitch in it. They closed the registration and immediately gave the golden sneaker to somebody else. We had 10 people, 9 or 10 in the parking lot, trying to get in the door to sign in. All right, we'll go down there this week and get that back, okay? <laughs> you know, we're not going to let them keep it. That's our golden sneaker. All right, Michelle, if you have any spray paint left, go ahead and use the left sneaker. Okay. But we've had a good week of, of doing what we're called to do, and that is ministering to the community and, uh, and ministering to those in need and enjoying it and, and having good ministry and fellowship along the line. So hope you will uh, find opportunities. I just want to say a couple of other quick things. Um, we mentioned All Saints service uh, next Sunday, so that will be an important service. And then we have coming up our stewardship emphasis, and you're going to enjoy this. We're going to use John Wesley's three-prong uh, kind of uh, challenge. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. So we're going to do that. And then on the 24th of November, be sure to put this on your calendar, we're going to have that wonderful Thanksgiving dinner. That, is, uh, that we've had the last couple of years at noon on the 24th. So you want to make sure. And we'll have reservations. And that is free of charge. That is a gift from the church to, to all of us for being faithful and doing what the Lord has required of us. And so uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, Kathleen, I don't have anything. Do you have any other uh, prayer? Well, look, before we go, I, I do want to, because he's here... Uh, Joe uh, Moore and uh, Whitney, so good to have you all with us. We had a, had a, I thought, a wonderful service for your mother and, and your wife, and it was, a, it was a day to celebrate her life among us. So we're glad you're here this morning. Yes. My wife, Georgia, is turning 39 again today. <laughs> Georgia Utt is celebrating her 39th birthday today, so... You wish her a happy birthday from all of us. It only gets better from there. So, uh, good. Did anybody else have a joy? I, I don't want to neglect the congregation. Anybody have a joy they want to lift up this morning? I guess we covered it, Kathleen. All right. All right. Um, I want to thank Kathy and the brass uh, and for everybody singing a mighty fortress is our God. Um, Thursday is the celebration of the Reformation. And we are here able to worship and read scriptures in our own language and hear the la worship in our own language because of the leaders in the Reformation. When there's many denominations from that, but it is something to remember. Thank you. Let us pray. 
almighty and sovereign God. Once again, when we were singing those words written by Martin Luther centuries ago, we are reminded that we still live in a world, in your world, where there is cruel hate and its manifestations are still found in a wide variety of ways, even within families and in local communities. When we remember that a year ago, there were people struggling with the hate as people were worshiping in a synagogue and how that hate continues to surround us in so many ways, individually, community, and even across nations. Pastor Burt just talked with the children about having vision and having 2020. Give to all of us who are here at worship the kind of vision that allows us to see you reflected in each other and in the people that we meet, whether it be an acquaintance, whether it be somebody while we are shopping or passing in the street. Allow us to not only see with our eyes, but to open our hearts to those in need, that we can respond as your son would teach us. It is so difficult, Lord, when we are angry with each other and our views seem to be the ones we want everybody to hear. Allow us to have patience with each other. And yes, Lord, during this time, especially as we were preparing for next Sunday, it is a time when we remember and we grieve those who have died as we also struggle with those who are suffering with diseases and yet medical interventions. Continue, O oh Lord, to give us strength to persevere into the future, knowing that you are with us, that you never fail us, though we have often failed you. When we lift each other up in celebrations for birthdays and joys, we come completely open-hearted to you. Hear our prayers, O oh Lord, spoken and unspoken, as we pray together the prayer your Son, our Lord, taught us to boldly pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In our first reading, the psalmist offers thanksgiving for God's bounty. Listen now to these words from Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed, O you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come, when deeds of inequity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose to bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds, you answer us with deliverance. O oh God, our salvation, you are the hope of all ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength, you establish the mountains, you are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. 
Those who live at the earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. Your water, it furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain, and they shout and sing together for joy. Here ends the first lesson.
The second reading is from Paul's second letter to Timothy, beginning with chapter 3, verse 14. Listen again for God's word to us this day. As for me, I am already being poured out as libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought a good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept my faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and that all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for, for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God for all God's people. Please stand as you're able as we receive today's gospel reading. It comes from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. God's word for us, God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We are just now at our house asking the question that comes about this time of year. What do you want for Christmas? Have you all started that yet? I know growing up, I grew up in another era like many of you did. This was pre-Amazon. You could not get it this afternoon. You know? In my town, you only had a choice of the two or three stores that had anything. You weren't going to, this was not going to be ordered. Uh, yes, there was the Sears catalog, but that, that, that required a level of, of commitment that my parents didn't have. Uh, they wanted to go to one of the stores in town, and if they had it, they would get it. Did any of you grow up under, under those kinds of conditions? Uh, you did, maybe even worse than that, uh, depending on your, your income or where you were. But uh, Christmas usually generated that question about December 23rd. It did not come this early. And surely it did not come when Walmart puts the decorations out in July. <laughs> I'm thinking as... Why do they even take those up? Why don't they just leave them in there all year long? And for people who say, I wish Christmas was every day, there you go. Just go up to your local Walmart. You can have Christmas every day. I mean, what difference does it make at this point whether they're in there six months or a year? It really makes no difference. It's beyond the point of absurdity, is it not? It's just beyond it. So why don't we just do everybody a favor and just leave them there all year long? So, the question then is, is honest, is an honest question. What do you want for Christmas? 
And you could translate it, what do you want for your birthday? What do you want for your anniversary? What do you want for your graduation gift? And invariably, the answer comes out like this. Oh, just surprise me. <laughs> anything is good. Anything will do. And you're trying to narrow this thing down so that you can go ahead and, 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 and transact this gift somewhere. And people are telling you, anything will be fine. Well, you're trying to take some of the stress off yourself of buying a gift, are you not? By getting some specifics from somebody. But now the stress is even exponential because you don't have a clue what to do. And so you spend the next three months just wringing hands over this thing. Well, it's, it generates a question, well, what do you really want? And that's where I want to kind of springboard in today's scripture. What does God really want? Just tell us straight up. Don't make us have to go through all of this religious hoopla and jump through religious hoops. What do you want? Be clear with us. One of my prayers that I have is, Lord, I will do whatever you say. Just clarify it. Just give me some details. Put it in an action plan. I am more than happy to follow your lead. But a lot of times, Kathleen, it just comes. That's why I say I have to wear my glasses at night so I can see the dream if God gives to me. Because sometimes it is so fuzzy what God wants. But going back to our scripture, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful scripture. And it would really have a lot to do with Reformation Sunday, saved by grace through faith. If we wanted to go back to Martin Luther in the 1500s where... Uh, he nailed the 95 Thesis on the door um, and said, this is what God requires. And so we're asking the question, what does God want? Well, in our scripture today, we have two, two men. It says two men. It could be two women. It could be whoever. Uh, they are just characters in a parable. Remember from last week, a parable is a fictitious story used by Jesus predominantly to tell a greater truth. It is not necessarily a true story. But when we end and we come out of that story, we know a little bit more about what Jesus is talking about. So these two men have gone up to the temple. Now in Jesus' day, whether you came from the mountaintop to the temple. The temple was always up. Home was always down. It was a theological direction. It was not an actual geographic direction. So when we read, he said that two men went up to the temple to pray. That is just what you do. You go up. I guess you could say you go up to the church and I go down back home because the temple was seen as that highest point where God would be uh, with the people. And two go up to pray. One is a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. That wonderful dichotomy that Jesus uses, he puts one person over here who is supposed to be supposedly the, the, the good person, the other person over here who is supposed to be the outcast or the one who gets no respect, and, and, and we've got these two characters here. The Pharisee, who is a religious leader of the day, has an interesting prayer. I think I've prayed this before myself. God, I thank you I'm not like those people over in Goochland County. I'm thankful I'm not like uh, those people that call me three times a day for an extended car warranty. I am thankful I am not those people who still, 20 years after it is no no good of a timeshare. I don't want to be like them. And especially, I don't know who this person is over here, but I am so glad I am not like that person. That's an interesting prayer, is it not? <laughs> I'm not sure this Pharisee was going to get any points from the time he opened his mouth. Was not going to do anything. Do you all get those calls three times a day for extended car warranty? I don't even know how. I might buy it next time if they keep going, <laughs> just to get them off my back. But um, anyway, I don't want to be like them. Now, the tax collector, 
who is seen as a traitor because they are collecting taxes for the occupying Roman government. How could any of the Jewish people resort to being a tax collector for the Roman government? They must be the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low, the outcast of the outcast. But the prayer was, have mercy on me, a sinner. Well, the story concludes, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. And so what does the Lord want? Obviously, that is the question before us. And apparently, we can start with what does the Lord not want? The Lord does not want this arrogant self-righteousness that so oftentimes when we build ourselves up to think that we're more important than everybody else, that we are closer to God than anyone else, that we are pleasing to God by what we do and not really concerned about the other person. One of these, what, as, you, as you grow in the Christian life, if you will stick around it long enough, if you will stick around Jesus long enough, you will find an interesting turn of our relationship with God. It starts out very much as rules. Do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. And we as Christians, even modern day Christians in 2019, can quote rules all day long. They could be official, they could be unofficial. We can look at all kinds of sources for those rules. Well, the Pharisee was, was a religious leader who was called to keep the rules. I fast twice a week, that's a rule. I give a tenth, that's a rule. I'm not like these, these other people who are disconnected from God, that's a rule. I don't associate with them, I'm glad I'm not like them. But sooner or later, rules come up short. They do not describe where God is in our life. And so we move then at either a slow pace or a great pace from rules to relationship. And that begins a whole new adventure with Jesus. That begins a whole new adventure understanding and receiving God's grace when we are tired of keeping the rules and we want the relationship. The tax collector didn't justify himself. He put himself in the presence of God and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus concluded that story as we said, this one went home justified. Well, justification and justify is a church word. You may not get it anywhere else, but we are big on this word. But what does it mean? In John Wesley's sermon, Justification by Faith, he writes this, and these are in John Wesley's words of the 1700s. The plain scriptural notation or notion of justification is pardon the forgiveness of sins. Pardon the forgiveness of sins. That is what happened to the man who said, Lord, have mercy on me. And to be justified means that one is now treated as righteous and worthy of salvation, worthy to be born again, worthy to have a new life, worthy to get on with their purpose that they were created. It sets the compass back to where it's supposed to be. It gives us a clean page. It gives us a clean slate. It gives us a new vision. It gives us 2020. So oftentimes our lives have gotten cloudy. We're not sure what God has for us and we just need to start all over again I suppose that was in the tax collectors mind the tax collectors saying everybody here dislikes me they've they've cut my family off from the temple they've cut me off I'm just trying to make a living I know it's not what everybody else expects me to do and I think he was asking for a new life Whereas the Pharisee just went back home, the tax collector went back home a new person. 
It's amazing. Once we kind of get past our own box, our own God-imposed box, that God is this and that's all God is ever going to be, and we start to realize that God is calling us into relationship, not just keeping rules. The other thing about this Pharisee is that this Pharisee drew a line down the middle of a sheet of paper and said, I fast, I tithe, I'm a good person. And his pros outweighed his cons. In other words, he didn't even put any cons on the paper. It's a perfect side. Therefore, he felt he was justified in his own mind. You know, we have to be careful when we're the only judge of ourselves. We have to be careful. On the day I turned 40, I made a commitment that I was going to learn to swim for exercise, not for recreation. I could swim for recreation. I took swimming lessons back, you know, back in the day when, when you just went to the pool and went to the lake and you had fun or you went to the beach. It was enough to stay alive if you had to. And you could do some, some, uh, some impressive things off the diving board, perhaps. But it didn't mean you could actually swim back and forth and back and forth and breathe correctly and do the right strokes and do that for 30 minutes or 20 minutes or 15 minutes or one mile or half a mile. That took a little bit of skill. I decided I wanted to do that. I liked that and I wanted to do it. And so I always got pretty good at it pretty quick because um, I, it just felt right to do. And so I was feeling good about myself over the course of weeks and months having done that. I was a member of the Tuckahoe Y over on Patterson Avenue, and I would go kind of mid-afternoon before too many people got to the pool. And I walked in. And the way they did it, they had like one lane for just, you know, anybody. People who couldn't swim, I suppose. You, you go over there. It was a very Pharisee type of place. And then, um, and then they had these lanes marked slow, medium, and fast. I've never seen it since. I guess that, you know, somebody told them that's not that good. Well, it was quiet in there that day, and it was, you know, it was a few, like, people in the open swim, and they weren't, they weren't making much progress. They were just having fun, actually. And then you've got those, like, um, like aerobics type in the slow. They're not moving, they're not moving like, to make distance, but they're moving. I mean, you know, this is in the water, moving, not going anywhere. And then the medium had, you know, I, I know I can do better than this person in the medium lane. Fast lane was wide open. I said, that's me. You know, I'm making good progress. I am good. So I went into that fast lane and I did my thing, whatever it was, and uh, feeling good about myself, so when the swim was over, I kind of hopped back on the edge and, you know, just getting my thoughts together. And I looked straight down to the other end of the pool, and the sign said, slow. The lifeguard had changed it while I was, <laughs> while I was swimming. And then, of course, over in the fast lane, you had a group of Navy SEALs that just showed up. <laughs> you have to be careful, do you not, about being the only judge of who you are. Because you could come up short, could you not, in your own thinking. Well, the Pharisee really did come up short because God did not hear what the Pharisee had to say. God heard what the sinner had to say. To be justified is not to think that you're nothing. To be justified by God is to realize you are something. To be justified by God is come to the realization that I am far more than I have ever thought I was. To be justified by God is to say, I want to move to the next step in my life. I want you, God, to pull out of me everything that you have put in me to make me the person that you created me to be. The story is over. 
It says, the tax collector went home justified. It's a powerful scripture, is it not? It reminds us that we do not have to be stuck in this life into some pattern of, of dysfunction or pattern of, of uncertainty or pattern of, of incompleteness. That's why we come every Sunday here, 52 Sundays out of the year, to put ourselves back together again so that we can step into our future with eyes wide open, chin up, shoulders back vision clear. That's what we call 2020. Amen. be seated. That was a tough prayer to sing. Um, it's been a while since I've sung those words, Kathy. They are um, tough, especially after that sermon where my toes got stepped on a lot. I didn't swim, but I've had that sign changed many. And yet it is with the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, that we have an opportunity and a privilege to return to God a portion of the gifts for which we have been blessed. If the ushers would please come forward.
invite you to join with me as we pray together the prayer of dedication. Whatever challenges we face, O oh God, we have also known your many blessings, food to eat, a home to live in, education and medical care. Accept these gifts as tokens of our thankfulness that they may be used to help those in need and to share your bounty with a gracious heart. Amen. can do, at least for the moment. Now it's your turn. It's our turn. We've read scripture. We've heard beautiful, beautiful music today. Hopefully you've heard a good sermon. I thought it was pretty good as I was delivering it. <laughs> Enjoyed it. Might want to, I may preach it again when I get home, just for my own benefit. But you now have the key to life. It's all yours. If you have not turned and, and looked and said, you know, maybe I, I can be better than this. Maybe life has more to give me than this. Maybe God's love is stronger than what I've allowed so far. Or maybe I've just kept God at a distance, afraid of God. Well, fears are relieved. It is time now for us to connect. Be in relationship with the one who loves us, the one who has created us, and the one who will care for us. And now go forth in peace 
May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you and be with you all today and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.